Hey everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the extraordinary honor and pleasure of chatting with bassist, producer, CEO, and founder of Compass Records, none other than Gary West. Yay! How are you? So many of you may have seen Gary playing with his wife, Grammy-winning Allison Brown on banjo in many of the iterations, whether it's been with the quartet or playing with the likes of Steve Martin and... Keb Mo and all kinds of folks, and we'll definitely want to talk a little bit about all of that, but we like to go to the past. How did you get started in music, and particularly on bass? Oh, well, the start in music was like a lot of guys my age, when every Sunday night was watching Bonanza, until one particular Sunday night when the Ed Sullivan show came on and the Beatles popped up, and it was all over. You know, I was consumed from that moment on with music and I didn't really know the, what the path would be through it. But, you know, started trying to play guitar and and always had a, uh, a passion going from that moment on and eventually got in the school band playing saxophone. Did that all through school and college, working on a music ed degree, playing a lot of big band music and and then had picked up the the uh, bass along the way. Again, a, a similar story to a lot of guys. I was playing guitar in, a, in a, uh, a band with some friends, and then we discovered that there was a, somebody else who was a much better guitar player. And so I got, uh, uh, got the chance to move to the bass, not unwillingly, and just loved it, stayed there, felt like the place to be, felt much more natural to me. Gotcha. And so as far as the bass goes, are you pretty much self-taught? I would say pretty much self-taught, but I have had some, a little formal education along the way. I mean, I had all of the music ed stuff from, you know, playing, playing sax. So mm -hmm. I, I can read and understand theory and, and all of that. And I went to Berkeley uh, on bass for a short time. It was after I'd already been out playing for a few years mm -hmm. and I'd kind of always wanted to go and I just needed to tick the list and also needed a, a kind of a reset from what I was doing. I was playing the local club circuit in Atlanta and there was one back then, you know, mm -hmm. it was at a time when you could work five, six nights a week, every week. And in some gigs where we would be in, in the same club for eight or 10 weeks straight. Yeah. And after a few years of that, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm in a bit of a rut and it seems like a good time to, to try this this Boston thing, you know, and so I moved up there and kind of stayed as long as I could afford, which was which was not long enough. Mm -hmm. But that gave me a chance to, you know, get into ensembles and and do some some reading and spent uh, a lot of quality time with uh, Rich Appleman, who was the head of the bass department at the time, who was my teacher. Nice. And you know, we we worked on bass stuff and we we talked a lot too. It was great. And then along the way, I've had some other just lessons here and there. I took a few lessons with Jerry Jamat when I was living up in the New York area, who's always a, a musical hero of mine. And then later on, I uh, had some lessons with Chuck Rainey and spent a bit of time with Chuck, uh, including him visiting in Nashville and staying at my house when he was coming in to do different things. And, you know, always trying to sit down with somebody and say, show me how you do that, you know. Yeah, I hear it, but I need to see it, you know, that sort of thing. Very cool. Well, it, it's always interesting when I talk to people that have gone to Berkeley, one of the main reasons they want to go is to be a working musician. Mm -hmm. And so if you've been a working musician before you go and you kind of, you know, you certainly can garner knowledge, but that purpose of going, well, this, I can be a working musician without finishing what I'm doing here. And so I've, I've talked to a few that maybe spent... Uh, certain amount of time at Berkeley and then you know they were already networking with somebody they got a gig and it's you know they went and took that and then never looked back so yeah well and that happens to a lot of a lot of musicians uh, at that school in particular yeah and when I was there was was back in the day when you know Buddy Rich or Maynard Ferguson would come into town one day and listen to the one o'clock band and then the next day the lead trumpet player would be gone. 
<laughs> you know, and so they become scoop musicians up and you wouldn't see them again. You just, you know, maybe hear about what they were doing. And I, I understand that there's still some of that going on. I have mm-hmm. a daughter there now who's who's about to be a senior and it's a completely different type of school mm-hmm. than when I was there because it was it was about you know ninety five percent jazz study with a little tolerance for for other things, you know. It's like Oh, well, you know, let's, yeah, let's analyze Bridge Over Troubled Water because you find out that there's some other things going on there, you know, it's like, you know, oh, what's that, a modulation, you know, within the tunes. So you start using those type of things or Burt Bacharach songs or mm-hmm. something for harmonic analysis. But as far as sitting around, you know, playing pop music, much less composing it and recording it during the school day, that didn't happen. You know, it was, it was just... Uh, full-time jazz pursuit yeah and you know i think that everybody has to figure out their own path and the best one if you're going to be a musician is one that doesn't have a plan b attached you know where you just start moving through it and figure that well i don't know where i'm heading but i know i'm going to start moving that direction and it'll it'll kind of figure itself out so people come and go and like i said for me i had been in a in a bar rut and I needed that reset, mental reset, and you know, find something else to think about and new things to think about. Of course, I moved back to Atlanta and immediately went back to work in, in clubs uh, <laughs> because you have to make a living too. But yeah. I was able to broaden my horizon and you know, start doing more wedding bands and playing standards on a more regular basis, which is always good. You know, it's just, there's nothing better to, to work through on the instrument, you know, if you're trying to learn the fingerboard, learn your way around, and that was a good thing to be able to focus on at the time. Nice, nice. And you're currently located in Nashville. Nashville. That, yeah, it, for a it, long time. Nice, nice. Well, that is a, a veritable cornucopia of music. <laughs> and so there's is, yeah, lots going on. There's a lot going on, way more than most people realize. You know, when I travel around and everybody asks about nashville and everybody has a a perception of it that you know is somewhat correct and and quite a bit off the mark usually because the 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 music environment has changed so much even since i came here i've been here 35 years wow and it was you know very much uh the heyday of country music when I came along in in that it was when country music really started or it had, you know, within 10 years prior to that really started hitting the numbers that that we that we still see. Well, sort of, you know, you don't see any numbers on anything anymore. But, you know, it it you had records that were multi million sellers consistently mm-hmm. and music row was busy all the time. And, you know, tape deliveries running up and down the alleys and cartage companies, you know, one truck having to back up to let the other one get by so they could get to the rear door of a studio. And it was it was a really vibrant scene at that time, but largely centered around the country music business and the, and that recorded output. And now, you know, we've got Black Keys living here and, and Jack White and the rumor has it that Ben Folds might be back. You know, um, he, I think he was gone for a while, and Paramore, and you know, I mean, so many important rock artists. You know, I mean, not just hit artists, but ones that have really made a difference and really had a, a strong influence. And then a lot of folks that just know both the history and what they're doing. You know, Dan Auerbach and his output with his studio and his label is tremendous because. He's so rooted in, in how records were made and and like me, tries to make records in that way, you know, with, with musicians in a room playing together, but so forward thinking too. And that's all around us, even though the recording environment's changed quite a bit, you know. Gotcha. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned that because how did the whole Compass Records thing come about? I think initially what made it possible for me is that, and this is all in hindsight, is that I never really seemed to be satisfied just pursuing playing the bass. 
or making music. You know, if I if I had a, a local band in Atlanta, then I was the one that ended up booking it and the one that ended up coordinating everything and you know trying to set the course of what we were going to be playing and you know what our goal was and all of that. And I think. Once I came to Nashville, uh, it was like most musicians come here, you, you basically arrive in town, then you get on a tour bus if you're lucky, and mm -hmm. you're gone. And, and that was the route in at the time. And that was what I moved here for, was to do whatever I needed to do to, to make a living playing professionally outside of the club circuit. I wanted to record, and I wanted to play live. And I started doing, eventually, started doing a number of sessions, as you do a lot of demos, and I had publishing account clients that I worked for regularly. And then as a result of that, I got to do a lot of showcases with artists. So there was local live playing going on. But I always had an interest in a little bit more. And, you know, I, I worked my way through a number of touring situations. And then I had actually gotten off the road with the purpose of staying home to produce, really focus on that. And then I met Allison. And that was at a time when she had been asked to be the band leader for a Los Angeles based artist. And she didn't, she came out of the really the bluegrass world out of Alison Krauss's band and really didn't know where to find a drummer, you know, or what they were supposed to do or anything else. And so we put that band together and got out on the road. And, you know, I think we were in, we were maybe three weeks into a European tour and had that feeling of, oh geez, well here I am back out on a bus. And so that's all day spent where you really can't do anything else but, but ride and wait. And that's if you're behaving yourself, you know? There was, there was no internet, you know, and, and it wasn't like you could be creative throughout the day and build anything, yeah. much less a business on a laptop. So after a, a while, we both started thinking about what a life in music might look like without having to be out on the road all the time. Nice. And with my production interests, with her MBA and her background, and I think what felt like a need to do something with it, you know, reward her parents for having paid all for all that college, you know, then a record label seemed to be the, the right place to put that effort. And it seemed like something that would host all of our interests, you know, production and making records ourselves, the business side of it. And at the time, really trying to figure out a solution because it was major labels and a few large independents that were the path to visibility. Mm -hmm. And and having worked with an independent label that Allison was recording for at the time, we just had an idea that there could be a better way to go about it and why why aren't labels owned by artists, you know, the way they used to be. Like, yeah. you know, the early, you know, I mean, Frank Sinatra started a reprise, you know, Herb Albert started A&M, and, mm -hmm. and there was always that influence in there. and. At the time, there was Ani DeFranco and John Prine were the only artists that had independent labels. And so we thought that that would be a way to go and would satisfy a lot of, uh, a lot of our interests along the way. And we really had no idea how long it would last or how far it might go or you know, what it would evolve into or anything, but, but it felt right. And it, it, it ticked boxes you know, in addition to just playing music. And, and we were able to make records and tour and, and have a business. And Very nice, very nice. Well, and most recently, Allison released on banjo, that would be this past May, and very interesting music because you mentioned bluegrass, but as I listen to it, it I'm, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a fusion of yeah. a lot of things. I hear a lot of the Latin jazz elements, the Brazilian music. There is bluegrass there, but there's a lot more to it yeah. so it is a, a part of the evolution of the form if you will and it's certainly a very unique application of banjo mm -hmm. well it is but i think that allison's efforts on the on the instrument have really always been that way and we're just kind of following that road her first record was produced by david grisman 
who had already gone off the bluegrass path by creating, you know, it was arguably a whole genre of, of what they called dog music, but mm -hmm. it was it was his efforts to bring together these young guys, um, which at the time were Tony Rice on guitar and Mike Marshall and Daryl Anger on fiddle and, and Todd Phillips on bass, who played second mandolin on the first David Grisman Quintet album, mm -hmm. but then switched to bass for the second one when Mike Marshall showed up. You know, there's always somebody that comes along and moves us off of our instrument under the bass. And Todd is one of my favorite bass players still. Yeah. Um, but that was a that was a fusion right there, you know. And John Hartford had been muddy in the water in the bluegrass world. Newgrass revival was around pre Bela Fleck even, and there were and the dirt band, of course, New York dirt band. So there were a lot of people that were kind of mixing things up and creating hybrids. And Allison came up playing bluegrass, but when she started writing her own music, it had a lot of other stuff in it. It had the 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 Grisman you know, gypsy swaying element. It had some of the, the Joe Pass that her dad used to listen to in the house all the time and all those elements coming into it. And that was her first solo album was, um, I think she recorded it in 89. And she didn't really make a bluegrass record until 2000. Wow. And so everything was a was kind of a fusion or hybrid from, from there on. And started she started working with piano player on her second album that mike marshall produced and i played a bit on that album it was in the works when we met and then when we started a band which is at the same time that we started the label that seemed like the way to do it you know mm -hmm. we worked as a quartet with a piano player and electric bass and drums and just trying to make sense of her music at the time so we've been following that path all along and this record's a little bit different than the last one, as they should be, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the last one we did a number of covers on there and trying to always do something that will help bring the banjo into the mainstream and make it not quite as scary to people, you know. And as Allison says, that when folks hear the banjo, they expect that, you know, there's a car chase or a bank robbery nearby. <laughs> And it's not quite like that, you know. And first of all, it doesn't have to have the very bright, intense tone that it does in bluegrass music, mm -hmm. which is perfect for bluegrass music and certainly has its place there. You can it can be a lot warmer, and you can do different things with it. And and then you have to follow the tunes, you know, and where they want to take you. And so that's what we've we've tried to do with you know the previous album. We had those covers, and we thought, well, you know, there's always the thought that. People will say, well, can you play something that I know so I can tell if you're good? <laughs> you know? So we did those. We did some instrumental things like Time After Time. Mm -hmm. uh, not the first to do that instrumentally, uh, certainly, but it's a beautiful song, and it worked really well on the instrument, and it, and it does let people know, oh, I see what's happening. You know, there's the melody, and then there are all those other notes, too, you mm -hmm. know? And we did some vocal tunes on that record, Indigo Girls, we did a version of What's Going On with Kev Moe that I'm particularly proud of because it brought together a lot of what the band is about. You know, Allison's accompaniment style and improvisational style, you know, the opportunity to try and and both tip your hat to James Jamerson and stay out of the way of everything else that's going on, mm -hmm. you know, just a, an interesting way to, to approach things. You know, that served that purpose. And with this record, Allison was just writing a lot of different music. And some of it started prior to the pandemic. And then that kind of opened up a, a period of time where she was just able to be a little bit more fanciful, fanciful about what she was doing and not really thinking about a concept for an album. Just, you know, let's let's record the music you've been writing and figure out how to framework it. And that's what led us to the different guests on the record. And each of those guests that that exist very strongly in their genre, they had a huge influence on the outcome of the track. Nice. You know, if we were doing it just as our band, it would have been quite different, you know. But if you're doing a, a classical tune with Sharon Isbin, who's one of the greatest classical guitarists anybody will ever hear, it's going to go that direction, you know, yeah. or a not Cohen playing clarinet, 
on a Shoro, it's going to sound way more real than if we were doing it on our own, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it's also interesting because the banjo per se, it hasn't necessarily been in the spotlight. And sometimes it's like somebody like Steve Martin picks it up and you go, wait, he... He plays yeah. banjo. No, he, he, granted, he's next to Kermit the Frog, but still, his visibility. <laughs> well, there's nobody's visibility like his, I can tell you, because yeah. just being in that bubble at all, it's phenomenal. But he's a really, really fine banjo player. And he very much has a voice that he's developed over the years, and mostly by being original. He writes his own tunes, and that's his inspiration for playing banjo. He's not someone that works through the lexicon of banjo music and knows all the standards. He, he's, more, he's way more forward-thinking than that and, and out front. And in particular, his claw hammer playing is, it just has a great feel to it and a lyricism to it that you don't often hear. And Allison plays in a way that's kind of light and lyrical too and when she's playing what they call scrug style banjo which is you know the three finger style with mm -hmm. a thumb pick and two metal picks with steve's claw hammer style it just fits together really really well and so anytime we've been out on the road with with him and and marty on their show there's always banjo jamming you know in the dressing room they're sitting around playing tunes before and and sometimes after the show and it just has a great feel to it. So that was an obvious thing to do. And that particular tune on the record, they started writing during the pandemic and when nobody could go anywhere. Allison wrote a, uh, an A section of a tune and sent it to Steve and said, hey, does this sound like something that you know, you're interested in and you, know, you want to add to it? And he sent back a B section and then they got on Zoom and, and kind of worked through the rest of it. And then we recorded it together in, in our studio in Nashville once we were back out moving around again, you know. And then the other things were done, some on Skype and, or, you know. Remotely. Via, you know, yeah. Very pass cool. off tracks, you know. Well, and I, I should get us, as interesting as banjo is, we should talk a little bit about bass again and how you get your sound. What are you playing on? Well, a number of things. My... My main bass is a 63 Fender Jazz, black one, refinished a long time ago. It was stripped when I bought it, and I had it refinished, and now it looks like a vintage. I mean, I've had it so long that it looks like the original finish. And that bass has a Sadowski preamp in it. Nice. An older one. And I actually had Roger cut a hole in the back for the battery, and. He hates it every time he sees it. He's like, oh, I wish I could have, you know, I could have done that differently a few years later, you know. <laughs> but I never regretted it for a minute because it, it wasn't an original instrument at the time. It, like I said, it had been stripped. But it's the stock pickups and, um, and just that early Sadowski preamp. And it works every time I pick it up. It, nice. It's probably the house on fire base. You know, it's the one that, that uh, I would grab. And, and, if, and it certainly is the one that if I could only take one instrument to a session, that would be the one. Because with the preamp circuitry in there, the two pots for the pickups, mm -hmm. you know, there's not a pan on there, so they're individual. And then there's a, a treble boost control and a bass boost control on it. And I mention that because he has different configurations nowadays, you know, some concentric knobs and different things, you know. But this one's pretty straightforward and if I need to make it sound like a P bass, I can. Mm -hmm. And if I need to make it sound like it's got flats on it, I almost can, you know, enough to get away with it anyway in a pinch. And it certainly is a big part of the sound of our band. It's the thing that I've always used and I and I use it in a kind of a preamp style, not a passive style. So it adds a little bit more fidelity to the to the bass part without sounding like a high-tech bass. Gotcha. And it being a traditional bolt-on neck, it works the way that's supposed to work. You know, if you play a double stop, the double stop isn't as loud as everything else that you've been playing, you know, because it's a bolt-on neck. And and that's the, the style that I listen to. You know, those, the players, Chuck Rainey I mentioned, and, and the R&B players, 
you know, that all played Fender basses, you know, if you if you go up high in the neck, it tends to tuck in where it should. Yeah. Whereas a, a newly built neck through body instrument is probably going to, you're probably going to stand out where you don't belong, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. And um, so that's why it works stylistically, and it's got enough fidelity to the sound that it blends really well with our band. I've got a number of other instruments. I've known Roger Sadowski since the mid-80s, and he says that I was the first bass player in Nashville to play his instruments. And I know I certainly introduced a lot of other folks to them and, you know, loaned my instruments out and guys like Michael Rhodes and Willie Weeks and Allison Presswood, who's just one of my favorite players. You know, they played my instruments and I think eventually got their own. <laughs> and I've got a couple. I have a, a jazz style, a light blue one that tends to show up in live photos that I that I tour with most of the time and uh, single coil pickups with a, I guess a little bit later preamp in it but does the same sort of thing you know that bass is from 91 alder body I've got a ash body maple top Sadowski with a maple fingerboard and his hum canceling pickups it, it's a different animal mm -hmm. itself though I can dumb it down pretty well <laughs> most things I put in my hands and I love that bass, a couple of his five strings. And then I've got the old, other old Fenders, you know. I've got a 59P bass with a rosewood board that is unbelievable. A 57 with a maple board, of course, because there was no rosewood board at that time. That's a remarkable sounding bass. 66 Mustang I use on some things. And an old Guild Starfire, a Rob Allen mouse bass. Uh, Hoffner, ah. you know, I mean, I have a studio, so I get to, you know, I can kind of have as many things around as I want, you know, <laughs> it makes it a lot easier, but th those are the main ones, the, the go-to instruments. Very cool. Do you have a preference in strings? Well, I use D'Addario most of the time, and otherwise the, the preference in strings might be the set that was on the bass when I bought it. <laughs> and you know, the 57P bass, I honestly don't know what's on there. There's some flats on there that were on the bass uh, when I got it, and I plugged it in, and I thought it sounded great, and I haven't done anything with it. And I've got, yeah, a, lo a lot of them like that. Got an old silver tone that's got flats on it, whatever was on there, and, and an old Hagstrom, and it's got really dead round wounds, and that's, it sounded good, so I haven't thought about changing them, you know. Nice. But I like the Dario. I have a a little bit of a backstock of their slow wounds that they were making a few years ago, which everybody I knew, everybody I know in Nashville loved those strings when they were making them and hated it when they stopped making them. Oh. And, and fortunately, I don't change my strings a lot, so I've got a little bit of a supply that holds me up, you know. And also some Sadowski strings back from, I don't know if Roger's still making strings anymore, I don't think so, but... I, I used a lot of sets of his, but yeah, it's if I if I was gonna reach in the drawer and pull out a new pack and put them on, it would be Diderio. Nice. Yeah. So, as we look forward, what is in the works for the future? What what are the plans? Just you know, more music, hopefully more adventure and more finding solutions for the challenges that we're all dealing with. Because the record business is, today is not the one that I started in. Mm and how records are made and certainly how they are sold or uploaded and consumed is night and day difference and the budgets aren't there that there used to be you know so we're always trying to find out how to keep doing music the way we like to which if Allison's producing if she's got a bluegrass band that's a that's a band in the studio doing it that way you know yeah and if I'm producing something I'm I'm booking a rhythm section and or the rest of a rhythm section and we're cutting tracks you know with all of us in the studio and much more fun than overdubbing things I do that for people they send me tracks to play on and and it's it's always a lot of fun because you never know what's coming in and you have to, it's a challenge to find your way through it but for some reason you know it can can take you I don't know 
a few takes or half hour or something to get a part that you like when you're overdubbing. Whereas if you were cutting it with a band, then you could just as likely get the second take and feel great. Yeah. You know, it's just a different, uh, just something different going on, you know. Well, there's an energy flow in the studio that's kind of contagious. I think, you know, musicians feeding off of each other mm -hmm. and it turns out to be more than the sum of just the individual if you, okay. you know, isolate them and have them just do their, their little bit. I agree. I, it's, I always think about the fact that there's both, there's both tension and compromise happening that's making something have a good feel to it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you spend a lot of time in the YouTube rabbit hole listening to isolated bass tracks or things like that. There's a lot of stuff out there nowadays, and you can listen to tracks that, you know, and records that came out 40 years ago or more that sounded perfectly tight. And then when you listen to the bass or the bass and drums isolated, you realize just how untight it is, <laughs> you know, and it's pushing and pulling and flexing and breathing together. It's much more like a whole organism yeah. than it is a part or a cell. And I'm fascinated by that. You know, I love it. I mean, find a, isolated Joe Osborne bass track and and uh, it's mind-blowing you know totally totally so, uh, yeah I, I appreciate that and the other thing is just great to be in the studio with with folks figuring it out you know mm -hmm. and and having a chance to react to what somebody's doing and and know that that if everybody listens to each other and collaborates it's going to be way better than anything that anyone would have done individually and that's always really satisfying is to is to work that way and then and then see how things especially as a producer see how things develop you know because you i might have a vision of a track when i start something but it, it could very well end up a lot different you know and i did a record with an incredible singer for our label mike ferris in, in nashville and i mean this guy is is just one of the most soulful singers you can hear anywhere. And, you know, when we cut the tracks, we did them all live. Some of them I did with two, with B3 and piano and two guitars at the same time with Mike singing, you know, what he thought were his scratch vocals, which in most cases ended up being the track that you hear on the record. Is oh, his wow. vocal, right? Because he's that kind of singer. That doesn't mean that we didn't re-record the vocal five or six times because he wanted to but the, at the end of the day you listen it's like man you know what you got on that second take with everybody is the thing and, but then we had a chance to to build on it and you know add horns and and background vocals and you know or vibes or you know whatever we we brought in and that's always a lot of fun and it's you know the limits are only budgetary at that point and, and time you know yeah but i just i love that that path that pursuit you know very nice very yeah. nice well and as we look forward if people want to know what you guys are up to and where you're going to be they should look at allison's website allisonbrown.com yes that'd be the way and the best thing is just sign up on the on her newsletter and we announce all of our dates there and you, know, you can follow bands in town and they're up on that site as well and you know as far as anything else i'm doing good luck <laughs> because i'm not on social media and i don't have a website or anything so gotcha. you know you can you can see the activity on the compass records website or red house records which is our other label and there could be you know some activity showing up there and get a sense of what's happening or or the label social media mm -hmm. uh, but yeah we're out there with allison with our band you know working as often as we can, which is not not full time given everything else, but you know yeah. we're we're out somewhere every month. Gotcha. Well, we can certainly check out her website and also her social, if I'm not mistaken. So the usual places, right. but it it is a great way to kind of keep track of what's happening. But there is such a flurry of activity all over her social media that I can see why it probably helps conserve your sanity if you don't stay there too long. Yeah, it's it, it's a it's it is a rabbit hole, you know. It can occupy your mind and be a distraction. And it certainly serves its purpose. I mean, there's nothing better than being able to communicate directly with fans, mm -hmm. and it's, it's something that we deal with with the label 
all the time. You know, we might hear 50 artists that we would love to be a part of developing, but if they aren't developing their own career with, with a fan base, it's kind of impossible for a commercial operation of any kind to come in and do it, you know, that, that, because it doesn't have the authenticity that people need now when they're making decisions about who to follow and who to listen to. And they want that, even if it's not personal engagement on social media, it feels like it. And, and fans look for that. And they really want to be a part of an artist's career. And you have to do it. You have to make it a part of it. So we enjoy that part and, and you know, trying to make things, keep things interesting in that way. And then I have plenty of other things to keep me busy than I mean, social media. But I'm not hard to find. I mean, you can, you know. Look up the label and you can email me at the label and I'm always out there somewhere. Very cool. Well, Gary, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule and all the stuff that you're doing to share with us. Folks, you've seen him here, Gary West on Bass Musician Magazine. Thanks, I appreciate it. Great talking with you.